Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, presented by Associates for Biblical Research. My name is Henry Smith. When we look around the world at the creatures that God has made, we see great variety and beauty. And one of the things that we see in the creatures that God has made is adaptation. Now, the adaptation of creatures has been touted as evidence for macro, macroevolutionary theory, and which would go against the history of what the Bible presents in the early chapters of Genesis. Today's episode is called, When Creatures Adapt, Revealing the Creator's Genius. And to explore the question of adaptation and how it actually fits the biblical worldview much better is Dr. Brian Thomas from the Institute for Creation Research. Hi, Brian. Welcome back to Digging for Truth. My friend, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks again. Okay, so we're going to talk about creaturely or creatures adaptation. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about this now. Some people are probably already starting to glaze over. Friends, don't glaze over. Dr. Thomas is going to guide us through this and explain what we're talking about. So we're talking about the animal kingdom. I guess it applies to human beings too, but our focus largely on the animal kingdom. Um, adaptation. Explain what that is, how it's been argued for evolution, and uh, kind of take us on a journey with that, if you would, please. Yeah, sure. It's my pleasure. Um, and, and I used to believe that I came from apes, and I used to believe that those apes uh, evolved over eons from uh, fish, because that's all I was ever taught um, uh, for many years growing up. And, and um, if that's the case, then how does that happen? And, and we were all told, you know, the same basic model, which is small incremental changes over vast eons. And so that's how you change an ape into a human. Little, one change at a time, one, let's say one DNA base at a time, and you can go from any creature to any other creature. That's, that's Darwinism, really, at, in a nutshell. And it, and, but once I started reading the Bible, I noticed... Uh, a, a stark contrast between that story, where we have where we have infinite uh, ability, you know, for one creature to 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 morph into any other creature, really. So so you can get fish to philosophers, um, but the Bible says ten times in Genesis chapter one that God created these creatures, plants, animals, humans, to reproduce according to their kinds. Ten times after its kind, after its kind. And not between kinds, so that's a big difference. And so, so then I started thinking, who, who's, whose word do I trust? The, my professor's word, the textbook's word, or this uh, crazy Bible thing? And so that began a journey for me of trying to figure out: do, do creatures really adapt in the way this small incremental changes um, uh, that are sorted through external environmental factors over eons? Is that really what goes down? And lately, um, we're finding the answer is not really, and it's exciting. Well, it's, that's a good explanation. So I think what I hear you saying is the conventional model is that incremental changes lead not only to changes within the animal itself and it, its descendants, but to other creatures uh, eventually over time, given enough time. Time is sort of the magic dust that you pour on all this. Obviously, you're not denying that uh, animals change when they reproduce. Uh, we obviously observe that in nature. Um, uh, but so, so what are some of the things that you see uh, that would fit the model you described better? Like, let's, let's, let's get started with that. This is so exciting. I'm, I, I think this is great. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, so it, so if, if that's really how it works, you know, small changes incrementally over eons, then we ought to see, you know, we ought to see creatures not changing much within, let's say, a human lifetime. Um, but what we're seeing now in the world of biology is a radical, it's like a subtle revolution because paper after paper is coming out describing um, rapid changes, rapid adaptations, not taking a long time happening right within a human lifetime, uh, easily. And, and some of these changes are not just fast uh, or rapid, but they're, some, of these change, some of these creature adaptations are reversible. So they, they make certain um, 
uh, changes to their body, to their metabolism, to their behavior, and they do it maybe over one generation. Uh, but then the next few generations, they revert right back to the to the to the uh, to the grand or great grandparents' um, suite of features, behavioral and physical features. So it's reversible. It turns out that it's rapid, and um, lo and behold, we're it's, biologists are finding almost accidentally that these changes um, are occurring according to uh, pre-designed scripts that appear to be running. In these in these creatures themselves, in their bodies, in their cells, somewhere. So I think a couple, couple of things I hear you saying is um, the reversibility is interesting to me because the, the I've, if I understand the classic model correctly, it's sort of like a change happens because of a mutation. It's kind of if I understood the at least that it's not reversible because the information is lost or something has happened. But I, what I hear you saying here is. There's a forward and moving back. So comment on that, and then maybe what's some of the maybe one or two factors that cause that? That we think is it external factors? Is it predators? What are what are some of the things that scientists conclude about that? Um, so I think at this point it would be easier to to start talking about a few examples. Okay, let's and, do it. Uh, uh, and so uh, let's say let's say we're talking about uh, some of these examples of uh, th that I was taught as um, classic um, examples of evolution, so incremental changes over eons. And one of those is like the peppered moth. I don't know if you remember that from your biology textbook from ninth grade. I do. Back in the 1800s. Uh, yeah. So the peppered moth. Um, and so so the story goes that that, uh, that you had a generation or two. Uh, well, well, the original population had white, whitish wings with peppers, pepper fle flecks on the wings. And then um, the Industrial Revolution happened, and you have soot that covered the white bark of these trees that they were supposedly living on. That's not true anymore, but um, that was the story anyway. And then after a while, the birds supposedly picked off all the white ones and left the black, the, the mostly dark, um, um, melanized wings Alive, so now you have a new population of uh, of dark peppered moths, darker colored peppered moths, and it was supposed to have been. Um, and my textbooks taught me that you know who did the selecting it was all those hungry birds. So it was the predator that that actually acted like a selector uh, would act. You know, someone with with for for um, with with insight, you know, and for uh, and um, knowledge. And anyway, select and will, volition, to be able to select some and not others. Right. Uh, now, the, but just a few years ago, uh, geneticists uh, um, examined what's going on in, in the genes of these peppered moths. And you still have today um, uh, peppered moths with mostly white wings and some with mostly dark wings. But the, the switch, there's an internal genetic switch um, called a TE transposal element. And it turns out that uh, the, the, the moths with dark wings have taken this transposal element, a, a piece of DNA, they clipped it out of their own uh, uh, one area and spliced it into another, another area of their DNA. And when they do that clipping and splicing, jumping gene is what you might think of it as, then that changes the regulation of melanization or, or pigmentation in the wings. In other words, it wasn't the birds at all it's the genetics, and it's the ability of these of these creatures to to snip and splice and move their own DNA to craft to craft variations within their kind. Excellent, excellent. Well, we have to pause on that. We need to go to a break, but we want to talk more about that and other creatures after this break. In a culture of intense Bible denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological field work and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Watch Lighthouse TV wherever you go. Available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. Search Lighthouse TV online on your streaming device or go to our website, lighthousetv.org, for more information. 
Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm here with Dr. Brian Thomas. We're talking about the adaptation of God's creatures. Okay, Brian, uh, you were talking about peppered moths, and it turns out that uh, it's actually a supercomputer programming of the DNA is what we're discovering here, uh, which is an argument all by itself for a creator. Uh, but another, another one is Darwin's famous finches. So uh, comment on that, if you would, please, and uh, go for it. Well, I appreciate that. And, and, and this was one of those icons of evolution, you know, Darwin's finches that got named after him, uh, mostly promoted by uh, researchers long after the fact. But those researchers looking for evidence of natural selection as a, however you want to define that, as a substitute designer, as a substitute God, a substitute creator. Uh, that's, that's really what Darwin was all about. And so his um, protégés and those following on um, have, have, have investigated these, these finches. And what they found is that there's a shift in their, um, it's not very big shift, but there's a change, subtle change in the shape and size of the beaks over generations. And so one, you know, one finch with a thick beak may have lay an egg and out pops a, a, a little baby finch with a beak that's a little thinner, maybe more slender. Well, the story I was told, and it was in my textbooks, is that it was the scarcity of certain food items during certain seasons that caused, um, that caused these finch beaks to shift in their size. And that um, accidental changes in their DNA sorted through um, the, the death of the unfit ones, the one that couldn't eat as well or as efficiently. It's a lot of death, you know, uh, in this Darwin, Darwinistic view. Um, that's what was doing it until lo and behold, the geneticists got involved and they actually found, um, they're actually looking at feech, uh, sorry, finch beak, uh, development in the embryo. And they, they imported a, um, so, so they, so they looked at the, the, the cells that are generating and building a beak inside the baby finch. And they, they tracked, basically they matched a, an, an algorithm or a formula that describes the shape of a cone, which is what which is what these beaks are shaped as a cone, a half a cone on top, half a cone on bottom, and it, and it turns out that they that there's a genetic switch that adjusts one of the variables in this formula that describes the shape of a cone, a 3D shape, and with with one or two of these variables uh, being um, adjustable, uh, then you can get a short beak, a longer beak. And you can get it not because there's any birds dying, but just because there's a there's a variability built into the genetics that are out, that are working themselves out in these cells that are producing beaks. So this was published in the technical articles, uh, technical you know biology based journals, and I I read them and I'm just blown away. Why was I not giving God the credit that He actually deserves as our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ? For, for building into these creatures the ability to adapt to various uh, circumstances and situations that they're going to encounter in their lives. Uh, he gets the credit, and I've been giving, even as a Christian, even as a creation-believing Christian, I've been giving credit to natural processes that, uh, boy, I should have been giving credit to the Lord for designing them into the creatures themselves. And that's, it's like a revolution in biology that we're seeing, and it's pointing toward the Creator. Yeah, it's all over the place. I mentioned like a supercomputer programming, you know, but a God is in that. You know, we do, we drift into what's called deism, you know, the idea that God has just wound things up and they go, but he's sovereignly involved in all of this, and it's remarkable, the design. Okay, so you wanted to talk about another subject. We have about two minutes in this segment, Dr. Thomas, to introduce to us blind cave fish, which probably people have heard of, I've heard of, and I know what story I've been told, but I want you to tell a different story. <laughs> uh, we're actually doing experiments now at the Institute on our own set of blind cave fish. It, 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 this is a popular um, fish to study, and so evolutionary biologists for decades have been studying them and looking for evidence of slow, gradual changes to go from the surface fish that has eyes, pigment, to a cave fish, which doesn't have any eyes and has very little pigment in its skin among many other adaptations. And their assumption is that it has taken a long time 
uh, and um, random changes. But what they're what they continuously discover almost by accident is okay. So these these cave fish can undergo a change that fast, but we thought it was going to take eons, you know. Uh, but when you when you have a rapid change and then it's reversible, you can go from pigment pigmented skin to unpigmented and then back. And this is what's happening in these creatures in our dozens of uh, of, of tanks that we have at the institute. We've exposed some of these cave fish to light, uh, like UV light. And what we found is uh, we were expecting maybe a couple generations down the line that the fish would, uh, you'd have baby fish that would like, if, if God wired them with the, with the ability to produce more pigment that would absorb and protect their DNA from that UV, then maybe a couple generations later, they would, they would be darker. Within 30 days, those blind cave fish who have had no pigment for countless generations instantly, well, very quickly within days, started producing dark pigmentation. And we're publishing these results in the next international conference on creationism. Wow, that's incredible. So within, so within days, so again, uh, the prediction of the model here, well, what you guys have discovered is we don't need these long periods of time for the change. Extremely rapid, uh, the creature is adapting to its environment, but because of the programming that God has given it, and we don't need these long periods of time for that to happen. That's exciting. That is so exciting. I can't wait to hear about that. I'm going to be at that conference, so I'm looking forward to hearing the presentation. And friends, thank you for watching Digging for Truth. We'll be right back after this message. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research, written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint. Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith. I'm here with Dr. Brian Thomas of ICR. Uh, topic of our show today is when creatures adapt, revealing the creator's genius. And not only that uh, creatures adapt, but they adapt rapidly. Long periods of time are unnecessary to the super, com really super computer programming of their DNA. Okay, Brian, we were talking about blind cave fish. I did, I did want to ask you, I was tempted to ask you this question. Is there any evidence of, of the blind cave fish moving back in the direction of redeveloping eyes? Uh, I, I couldn't help but think that. Uh, you would think from the conventional model that would be impossible. But uh, what, what, are you seeing anything about that with your science? Well, it's, that, that's a great question. It's, it's easy to think um, um, if you already have a Darwinian perspective you know, in mind, oh, well, the creature lost its eyes. You know, that's, that's a loss of function. It's a loss of structure. That's easier to explain in a, in a, in a world where accidents, genetic accidents rule yes. creature adaptations. Uh, but it's, it's not as easy when you consider that the blind cavefish that we're working with, which is Mexican blind tetra, Astyanax mexicanus, these creatures have a whole suite of sensory uh, functions that replace the eyes. So it doesn't have eyes, but it has enhanced uh, what are called lateral line pressure sensors. They've got the fish have these lateral lines that go along the sides of their body. And so, so they're swimming around in our tanks and you can order blind cave fish, you know, on, you know, you can order them and, and, and have, have them sent to your house, you know, three bucks a fish. Um, and you can have them at your home and watch them, watch them navigate. They don't need eyes. They work perfectly well without eyes and they have enhanced, um, um, chemical sensing, um, and then they have, the, they have enhanced um, brain power to process the chemical senses and the pressure senses that come in. So they don't run into each other. They, they avoid objects and everything just fine without, without eyes. Uh, but, but, the question, but the question, okay, so that tells us maybe our Darwinian accident-based model mm -hmm. doesn't explain this, because it's, it's not just a loss of eyes. It's a replacement of eyes with a, 
a whole additional suite of sensory apparatus, biological apparatus that these fish use to navigate in their completely dark world. Um, and so we're thinking now in terms of um, what if the creator did exactly what he said he did? He told these creatures to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, right? That's from Genesis 1. Yes. And, and the plants. And so he knew, he foreknew that the earth was going to have continuously changing environments. He knew, you know, there were seasons established right early on. They shall be for signs and for seasons, for days and for years, he said on day four, talking about the stars. So he knew the seasons were going to be in effect. So, so you have changing environmental conditions. And, and he would want to, I would think, equip his creatures to do the very thing that he commanded them to do. Multiply and fill, fill the earth. So fill the earth's ever-changing environments. And so why not go ahead and give the original tetra fish, of which there are many variations, um, a, a, an option, L like like deploying a Swiss Army knife blade. If if you encounter a, um, a, if you encounter a, a, a can, then here's a can opener. Flip, yeah. and you could flip out a can opener in one generation. Uh, but if you encounter an apple, you, you know, another another option that you have is to flip open the blade. It's, you can use that to cut the apple. And so it's like one option is you can have a suite of features that enable, enable you to live in a cave with low nutrient, low light. Um, and then another another option that you have in your suite of Swiss Army knives uh, uh, deployments available is to live on the surface. And uh, But there's one report, to answer your question, there's one report of a speculation from the 70s that we've found hundreds of technical journal articles have been written on these fish, and only one of them has a speculation that an observed population of Mexican blind tetra in a, in a tank in Texas may have reacquired eyes. But who knows how many generations that might take, but yeah. if we could get that to happen, then it would almost be miraculous except for the fact that they have somehow retained the genetic information to redeploy the eye option. Um, but we, we're thinking it's more likely that we're going to see the sighted fish turn blind in our simulated caves, and we might, see, we might see them switch off their eye production and switch on the blind uh, version of these fish, um, let's say within the next uh, several generations maybe. We don't know. That's how science goes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, you know, I'm I'm I, you know, I prepared for the show and these questions that we've interacted with. But even even in my question, I realized that I was having Darwinian assumptions in the way I framed the question. It's really remarkable. So like even though I'm f very aware of this, I still asked you a question that sort of had that built in there. And it just shows you how much it's influenced us in the way that we think about these things. Okay, Brian, I was gonna ask you, we were gonna talk about one more subject, but we're gonna run out of time if we do that. So it's, I think, more important for you, about a minute and a half, to summarize all this. Why does it matter? Why, why does the science matter? Um, and just share your, your thoughts about uh, why this is all important. Okay, it's important for several reasons, and I'll just pick one. It's important, it has important implications for, for each of our souls, each of our eternal destinies, because it's the Bible that teaches the basic spiritual truths that we cannot save ourselves, we have sins, and um, if we have to pay the price for our own sins, the penalty for that is death. And um, that's in the Bible. But it's the same Bible that teaches that we have um, a Savior, who came, God became man, one of us, died the death penalty in our place, right, so that we can trust in him and be born again and have new life in Christ and relationship with him that begins now and, and lasts forever. And that forgiveness is a spiritual truth that comes from the same Bible that gives historical information, okay? And so we have generations of even generations of, of uh, Americans, certainly, but even Christians who kind of look at parts of the Bible and go, I guess I'll trust that part, but I don't know about trusting the Genesis part. And what we're saying is biology is transforming. New discoveries are transforming what we thought about how creatures adapt to where now we're convinced that God gets the credit for, for designing these creatures to adapt. And he also gets the credit 
for uh, designing a way for us to um, to live with Him forever. Same Bible, um, same message, Amen. all trustworthy. That's beautiful, Dr. Thomas. Brian, thank you for being a friend of ABR and for all your hard work. Thank you. Friends, uh, we heard the message that Brian uh, gave you. Jesus said in John chapter 5, if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how, you will, believe my, how will you believe my words? And so in that same spirit, we want to encourage you to believe not only what Moses gave us in the early chapters of Genesis, but the gospel of Jesus, who fulfills all that came in the old. We hope you'll embrace this great truth today. Thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth.